Hey everybody, thanks for sticking around. Uh, we got uh, filmmaker Sean Cox coming up next. He's been working on a um, documentary on the UFO uh, wave in Withville. Um, and he's an educator and uh, he is a, a UFO enthusiast as well. So uh, everybody put your hands together, Mr. Sean Cox. Thank you. Um, we do, I do have a clip, it's the first, uh, well, theoretically, the first four minutes of the film. And I was debating on whether, well, should we do this at the beginning or should we do this at the end? I'm feeling, let's go ahead and do this at the beginning. And I'm gonna step out of the way, maybe we get it full screen, and then I can bore you. <laughs> no more Zoom meetings. Times since 1987, residents who looked up and said they saw mysterious patterns of light, dark shapes that glided by without a sound. The media are fascinated by it. Then at some point, somebody comes up with an answer. The answer then becomes canonical. In the Whitville case, the canonical answer was that these were airplanes refueling. But the universal claim was that they were too low. If it wasn't us, if it wasn't the military, why didn't we have the troops and the National Guard here to protect our people? Because they were being harassed. I was being harassed. I tell people all the time, before you stand on the high step and tell somebody you saw this or go public, you need to take them and reevaluate, talk with your family, and ensure they're ready to go through the trip with you because sometimes it's, it's really tough, and especially if you think somebody's going to do something to your family. Theoretically, is the opening to the film. 
it's probably about 70% done, um, which I like to tell myself, man, in reality is probably about 60 or 50% done. But um, it's been 10 years in the making. And when you hear that, it sounds really cool, right? Like 10 years in the making. Um, it's, uh, that's something they can say in Hollywood, um, but most of the time what that actually means is there were a lot of problems. And in my case, yes, there have been a lot of problems um, with the film. And not in terms of like getting cooperation or, or things, but I'm an independent filmmaker. I don't have money. I don't have thousands or millions of dollars. I don't have thousands of dollars. I have to do this myself. You'll see a lot of names associated with this. Um, but it's been probably, in the last five years, it's really just fallen to me. Which I'm, is good, but I work a full-time job. It's, there, there's a lot going on. Now, when, when I first started the project, I had a business partner. Um, a friend of mine, he's still a friend of mine. We, we left on like very good terms. Uh, Chris uh, was going through some life changes, decided he wanted to spend more time with his kids, decided he wanted to make a kid's show kids TV show with real kids. And that sounded like punishment for a crime I did not commit. <laughs> and Chris said, you know, I know you didn't ask for that. And I'm like, no, I did not ask for that. You're very astute. And we just broke up the partnership. And we're still buddies, you know, we still hang out. We, we still, I, I really do love him, he's a great guy. Um, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. I also had a, a friend of mine who was a business partner, a silent partner who had agreed to, to finance this, at least in part. And that's not as nice a story. Unfortunately, Jim Hundrup, who's a great guy, a wonderful friend, and uh, was very helpful at a critical moment, was killed in a hit and run accident in Galveston, Texas that is still unsolved. Um, and he was a doctor and a very productive member of society and it was, it was quite a tragedy. Um, and I miss him and I get emotional about it, so forgive me. Now, at this point I wanna talk a little bit about spin, you know? Because this, this kind of subject is very, um, it's, it invites a lot of spin. If I wanted to, I could tell you that I lost a business partner over this, that another business partner was mysteriously killed, and that my computer was destroyed. All of those things are absolutely true. They're true. But the government didn't do this. <laughs> this, was, this was life. This was the way life works. I get that question sometimes. Do you think that the government had something to do with it? And I, I resist that term in general just because it's too vague. What government? You know, I, I do think that there's a lot going on in the federal government that we don't know about. There may be more than one layer of the government. I have no problem with that idea. Um, but as I've always said, if you wanted, if you were working for the government, you would want the story I'm trying to tell out if you wanted to keep people away from UFOs. Because this is a story about Danny Gordon. I can't tell you what was in the skies of Withville. I cannot explain that. I don't know. I can offer theories, I can put pieces of evidence together and say, oh, it's this or that. I can't tell you it was aliens from Zeta Reticuli. I can't. What I can tell you is a very decent, intelligent man was put through hell. I uh, Also, if there are any secret government people here and you want me to shut up, please don't threaten my family. It's very simple. Just deposit a million dollars in my bank account. <laughs> Shut up, I will be gone. You will not see me. So if you're there, just keep that in mind. Um, well, so people ask me, well, what did you know about this before you started? Um, yeah, kind of. Uh, the events began in late 1987. In late 1987, I had just met the most incredible, wonderful woman in the world, and I was madly in love, and if a UFO had landed on my car, I wouldn't have even noticed, right? And she is still the most beautiful, wonderful woman. I'm still married to her after we were married within a year of that. Um, I love her to death, and she puts up with this craziness, and so I bought her a T-shirt today. Um, <laughs> uh, love you, baby. Um, so in 1987, I heard about it. I was a student at Virginia Tech. I was an undergraduate at Virginia Tech. 
I kind of knew about it. It was not the most important thing on my radar, you know? I was in a band, I was gonna be on the cover of Rolling Stone. There were a lot of big, bigger plans. Um, and then later, a few years later, after we'd had a child and we were um, doing, our, you know, the, the young family thing, we got very into Unsolved Mysteries. And I saw this on Unsolved Mysteries, which I assume a lot of people have seen that um, broadcast it, even in, you know, on YouTube or something. And it's uh, still one of the better ones, it really is. And um, I was like, wow. That's a really cool story, but I wasn't anywhere near making films. Then we probably around 93 or 4, we had a party out at our house in Craig County. And uh, there was beer involved in this story, I will admit that. Um, and I sat down, you know, I was talking to some of my friends and they were kicking around weird stories. And then um, one of my friends, said, well, the weirdest thing that ever happened to me was around Withful. And I was like, well, okay, tell the story, what is that? He says, he's, he and his now ex-wife were driving down the highway. Uh, they were coming back from vacation, they were on 81. Uh, she was driving, he was relaxing in the passenger seat, and they noticed something coming down the highway, she sees it, uh, if I, now I am retelling this story, so I could get details wrong, but I think she saw it in the rear view mirror, coming right straight down the highway. My friend sees this, he leans out the window, and he says it just paces his car. And it's right above them, not, and about, if I'm not mistaken, it's about the width of the roadway. And he said, if I could have stood on top of my car, I could have touched the bottom of it. And then it went, it was gone. Well, that's a pretty damn good story. And if you're having beer, it's an even better story, right? <laughs> so it stuck with me. It, it stayed with me. I thought, wow, that, that's so cool, you know? I'd always had an interest in this stuff. People ask me, have you ever seen UFOs? I've seen two, one when I was a kid, and we lived near a naval base. That doesn't count. The other was 4th of July. And so even though I know it was not fireworks, I, you know. So, but I, uh, I have a great love of science fiction. And in fact, I should have a book coming out about um, some science fiction movies from the 50s in, in the fall. So um, it's a very, you know, I was primed for this, but I wasn't anywhere near making films. Then somehow, oh, it was, I was watching a documentary uh, on the Mothman. I think it was Eyes of the Mothman. Has anybody seen this? This, was, this is a long one. It's like three hours. Really in detail, really pretty good. Um, the, they interviewed Linda Scarberry. And, uh, Linda Scarberry was one of the first recorded witnesses of the Mothman. And what struck me watching this was that 40 years later, she was terrified. She was nervous. She had all the tics. She was like looking around as she was giving the interview. She looked like she was in pain. And I'm watching, and not to be critical of the filmmakers because they have a job to tell the story, but they were sort of ignoring that and saying, tell me your story, tell me, tell me more about it. They wanted the details. And what struck me at that moment was, oh my God, this woman is a prop. She's not a human being in this context. She's just, she's there as a part of the story, but it was real to her. So even if, even if you wanted, this is probably not the crowd to dismiss Mothman, but if you were, you, you could look at the, her and you, it, Mothman was real to her, no doubt about it, 100%. And it screwed her life up. Well, not long after that, I had a chance to see um, an interview with Bob Gimlin. And if you don't know who Bob Gimlin is, uh, you've all seen the famous uh, Bigfoot film from the, the 1968, I believe, 67, 68. It's called the Patterson-Gimlin film. Patterson is far more famous because he was a promoter and a, maybe a bit of a shyster, um, but Gimlin was there as well. And I saw an interview with him, and he was talking about how this had screwed his life up. It to, to, to be a part of that, 
wrecked his marriage. It, he lost a job out of it. There, I don't, I'm going from memory here, so I don't remember everything he said. But it was clear, just like Linda Scarberry, it had really ruined his life. Then there was Travis Walton, which I'm sure a lot of people know who Travis Walton was. The famous Fire in the Sky film adaptation of his experience in Arizona of being abducted. Travis Walton case is really weird. And he was never the same person. And it struck me that, okay, now here you've got all of these people with these abnormal experiences. And let's take them for, say, for um, face value. The, these are sane people, these are intelligent people. Even if they're mistaken about what they saw, it was real and, uh, you know, you don't get that freaked out over an owl, right? You just don't. So something weird happened. Was it in her brain? Was it in his brain? I don't know, I can't tell you that. But it was real, as real as it, because where is reality? If it's not in your brain, where is it, right? You're constantly interpreting information. One of the things that's important to keep in mind about being human is we're the only animals that interpret as far as we know. My cat, we got a new truck, and my cat was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> but then when it was, you know, okay, just truck, we're cool. He hasn't thought about it since. He's not worried about that cat, truck. He's not trying to interpret it in his world. It doesn't have any, any bigger reality to it, but we humans, we do that. We interpret, we create art, we, we write. You know, and we dream and we have these experiences and reality is to some degree in our brains. I think some people, this is just me, I'm not gonna get too much into the theory aspect here, but I think some people simply are wired in ways that allow them to perceive different layers of reality. Um, I don't think that's crazy. You have some people who are wired to be musicians from birth, right? They're just born to do it. Um, you have some people who are wired to, to be athletes. You have some people who are wired to, to um, you know, be business people. Um, when you see somebody who's weird, their reality is their reality. So just keep it in mind. You know, from your, their point of view, you might be pretty weird, right? Um, so that's been my approach to this. Now, Danny Gordon was somebody nearby. And I don't remember exactly how it came up again for me, but I thought, okay, I knew enough about this story and started researching this story to realize, well, Danny's life got bad. It got weird. It got difficult. You know, there's this whole idea that people um, do these things to cash in, right? Eh, well, I wouldn't tell you to ask Danny, but uh, you know, you didn't see Danny's Maserati sitting out front, okay? It doesn't work like that. Um, when people have these kinds of experiences, they do not tend to improve their lives, they tend to make their lives far more complicated. Now, when I went through the process of finding people to talk about, or to, to talk to for this film, there were several who wanted to talk to me and have said, oh, I'll talk to you about it on camera. And I get this. Now, I wanna go back to this story about the vehicle flying over the car. I get into the process of doing this, going through old newspaper reports. And Danny had mentioned this, and I think he mentions it in the book. There was a family from Ohio that claimed they had been run off the road by a UFO. They were traveling through, they had no idea any of this was going on, and within that, during that week, yeah, it happened was reported in the news. I've tried to get police reports on it, but what they told me was there was no crime was committed and nobody filed any charges. So they have no record of it, which is probably true. Um, so that struck me like, oh, well, now all of a sudden my friend's story has a little more legitimacy. So then I go down to the Withville, I think it was the Enterprise, the newspaper. Am I right on that, it's Withville Enterprise? Um, is, uh, this was a few years back now and I'm getting some information, I'm looking through their old records. The lady says she wants to talk to me because she had an experience, she's a woman who worked there. And there was this guy, kind of sheepish, took a, you know how you, you, know, you kind of hang around and keep your ear out and you take an interest, but you don't want to be a part of it? Well, this is what I was picking up on. And I asked him, I said, well, so did you have 
Did you have something happen? And he's like, yeah, I did. I don't know if I want to talk about it. And I said, you don't have to talk about it. Um, it'd be great if you would. You're not alone. I'm telling you right now, you're not alone. He sits down. He tells me this story. He's coming down 81 from rural retreat after a basketball game. Object flies over his car about the width of the roadway, paces him, then phew, takes off. It's the identical story from a completely different person. Never, They never knew each other. None of them have ever sought anything out of it. That told me there was something real. That, that made it clear to me there was a real physical phenomenon that was involved. Now, what it is, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you that. I don't know. Um, I, maybe it is aliens from Zeta Reticula. Maybe it is, quote, the government. I've, ha I've talked to people in the military, <coughs> similar to what you've heard today, and I'm sure you've heard before. Uh, yeah, the military is officially 25 years ahead of the rest of us. That's officially. But um, the rate of science and, and progress is exponential. I mean, it starts to pick up faster and faster and faster and faster. I'm not convinced we need to get craft from another world. I think we're pretty damn smart. Um, we, it, wouldn't help, it wouldn't hurt. And as one of the speakers said, if we did, we sure would want to exploit it. I have no problems believing that if it did happen. Uh, I can't be sure it happened. Um, but so you've got this sort of thing that is happening all the time in closed quarters. Of course they're doing research they're not telling you about. I hate saying they, I really do. But uh, my language doesn't give me a lot of better choices. So whoever they are, yeah, there's no doubt that um, there's research going on you don't know about. Of course, are they calling you up and telling you, hey, listen, we just wanted to, listen, we got a secret project. Uh, we just want to check with you if it's cool, you know? That's not the way that works. Um, and, and, you know, I think Danny will say it the way he has said it to me. I don't want to step on Danny's story. But the way Danny has said it to me is, I'm a patriot. If my government is working on things that help keep us safe, I'm all for that. I'm not going to get there. <coughs> um, there are, there's a lot of question about what the, you know, how these things might be applied. But, yeah, I've had several people tell me that. There were, I also get the question, well, you must have some theory. You must think that, you, come on, come on, you know it was, it was, was it military? Like I know, right? I don't know. I, I can't imagine there was no, there were definitely military interest in this. A number of people tell me that they even saw, there was vans that were marked from NASA here, and I don't know that that means that they were out here studying it. But uh, sure, I don't, Danny contacted the military, so they did definitely take an interest in this. He talked to people in the Pentagon. Um, they knew that this was going on. That um, I have one of the more interesting theories that I've heard, more sort of mundane, grounded theories, would be that um, the military was developing uh, stealth balloons or stealth uh, dirigibles, and early drone tests would account for the way some of these red lights were coming in, and the idea of a, a sort of a, an open bay where. Um, uh, vehicles were coming in and out. Of course, I can't tell you for sure that that's what happened. But uh, if you want to, I always say, okay, we'll start with something rational, reasonable, grounded. And when that doesn't answer all your questions, start looking at the next level and the next level. And sometimes it doesn't answer all your questions. Sometimes it really just doesn't. Um, I'm interested, I want to check my time here because I'm, I'm only going, yeah, I'm doing okay. Um, I'm only going for about a half hour. Be happy to take some questions. Um, we, Danny is coming up at four and I don't want to, you know, I want to give him enough time to get up here and do his thing. Um, the film is not complete. I hope it will be complete by this time next year. I work a full-time job. I have a family and a life, and um, you know, they're, they're, and it's just me now. So when I started, I was director producer, which sounds fantastic, right? Now I'm director producer, writer, editor, uh, color correctionist, audio balancer. <laughs> I mean, a head cook and bottle washer, um, and it's okay, but it just you get to the end of the day, and how much do you have for this, right? Um, so, but I'm committed to getting this completed again because um, the story is important. 
I can't tell you what happened in the sky. I can tell you what happened on the ground. I can tell you how it affected people. I can't be definitive about uh, what those objects were. I can tell you that there, there was something there. One thing I would say to you too is the, the variety of objects reported and the number of people reporting them is pretty significant. The very first sighting, uh, recorded sighting, happened at a pep rally for a football game. There were hundreds of people there, including police officers and former military folks who witnessed it. Um, I talked to one of the original witnesses and there's no doubt that she's saying just hovered there. Uh, as I recall, um, I wanna say large black object, can't remember if it was triangular or spherical, I haven't looked at that tape in a year. Um, but uh, she definitely saw something and a lot of other people did. But what gets weird about this case is there were reports of flying school buses and flying boxes, like orange rectangular boxes. Um, the only thing I can tell you is, if we go back to the idea that our, our brains are constantly interpreting and we may all be wired slightly differently, is I might look at that and see one thing and your brain might see something totally different. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not real. And, and I ask you, consider it. Consider this, let's say you go to a party and then a week later you ask three people what happened at the party. Are you gonna get the same story? Of course not. It doesn't mean the party didn't happen, right? It doesn't mean that the experience wasn't real. So that was the fight that I think was the hardest in a way. All of, I'm, again, I'm not gonna step on Danny's story, but boy, a lot of strange things happened to him. And a lot, and it, and it really made it hard for him to get through his day. He went for weeks and weeks without decent food or sleep. Um, and people would call him up at two or three in the morning wanting to report something. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, imagine, imagine getting any phone call at three in the morning, right? Like, what do you think? If your phone rings at three in the morning, what do you think? Somebody's dead, right? You, you immediately go in panic. So uh, he had people break into his house. He had people who seemed to know details about his life that probably should not have known any details about his life. That's weird. And that changes a person. I, I will say one of the things I admire about Danny, and I really like the guy. Um, one of the things I admire about Danny is despite all this, he's still a pretty normal, <laughs> grounded dude. He's not looking for a strange, exotic explanation. He's looking for the correct explanation, whatever it is. Um, and that is an admirable quality because I don't know how I would fare. You know, I've referenced my cats already today. I'm gonna reference my cats again. When they're out a little too late, I get nervous, right? These are cats I'm talking about, <laughs> which are literally built for that. Um, so I don't know how I would have fared at all with people calling your house, telling you that the CIA is gonna kill your children, which has really happened to Danny. Um, and I don't know if, um, I mean, he certainly handled it with a great deal of grace and I commend him for that. And his willingness to talk about it um, is pretty amazing, but he was a reporter and he felt an obligation to the truth. And as such, he did a duty, a public service duty that put him and his family into at least psychological jeopardy, if not physical jeopardy. And, and, and that, you know, psychological stuff is bad because it never leaves you. It's always there in the background somewhere. So I do admire him for that. Um, so I am still interested in talking to anybody who has had an experience. Um, I have some business cards here. I'm happy to give them to you. If you know somebody who might want to talk, uh, I probably will do one more round of interviews. As I said, I don't have any money. <laughs> so, um, so I'm, A, I'm not paying you, and B, it's gotta be where I can drive to and you know have a day and get back home. Um, so, but then again, that's what with the lives, right? It's pretty close to me. I've had some other people who have spoken out and I feel like they've been very brave about that too. Uh, I don't think there's any threat. I, I really, I don't think like men in black are gonna come visit you. If that was gonna happen, and there were reports that it happened early on, it was gonna happen a long time ago. Um, I, don't, I don't think he would be harassed, I, but I also would not say you have a moral obligation to tell me something. You don't, 
and not at all. You gotta figure out what's right for you. But if you know somebody, if you want a business card just to have a business card, my website needs to be ter terribly needs to be updated so you can shoot me a nasty email and say, when the hell are you gonna re redo that website? Because okay? that might light a fire on me, get me going. Um, I've really appreciated being here. Thank you for having me, Brian. And is your wife's name Robin? Is that right? I caught that? Okay. Um, I think they've done a great job. Uh, this is way better than I expected. <laughs> <That's personal. laughs> I didn't know what to expect. And um, because of that, uh, you know, I hope we're back here next year and I hope you're able to watch a full film next year. Um, and please don't hesitate to uh, talk to me. I'll be happy to give you a, a, a business card. But we want to make sure Danny is up here at four, so I'm gonna, probably going to shut up. All right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. And we're going to take a short little break.